Kelly, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about your latest release, The Year of Goodbyes and Hellos. And I had a chance to read this and it is such a beautiful book. And mm -hmm. I got to congratulate you because given the, the seriousness of the topic, this is a book that talks about cancer, the levity and the love and the joy that is in this book is just amazing and so i'm not saying it's an easy book i'm just saying it really it made me cry it made me smile what a beautiful beautiful novel you've written here oh thank you i appreciate that so much um it, you know it's the book of my heart so it's it's always nice to hear that others are are touched by it i really appreciate yeah. that yeah and i noticed that um you describe it um somewhere in the in the description i saw it described as christian fiction or the word christian came up in the description and i thought that was really interesting because it's not in any way heavy-handed in the christian themes right like they're there no. but but no. it's interesting that it, i don't know if i would have led with that word even myself if someone had asked me to describe the book and so i, I was really fascinated by that it, it's um I think it's Christian in the sense that we all grapple with what we believe and we have uh, questions and those questions don't always get answered. And so that conversation and that uh, tussle goes on in the book. And so there, that theme is in there, but it's not what you would typically think of as Christian fiction. Yeah, it's really in context. Like, talk about a moment that you question, right, your faith in God and you question, like, yeah. is there really a greater plan, right? This is yeah. the moment in life where that is clearly going to be a conversation for, with yourself, right? Well, I think um, anybody who's facing their, um, you know, they, they find out they have a terminal disease is going to have that conversation. I know I did. <laughs> so um, it comes from a place of, you know, I was a Christian and then I got this diagnosis and I thought, well, you know, do I, what is it that I really believe? <laughs> so, so you led us straight there. So this book is really special. It is inspired by your own experience. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, well, I was diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer in 2016. Um, so I've been living with it for almost, um, well, seven and a half years. And I'm in a clinical trial now uh, that is uh, holding the, the line on it and i've been very blessed to be uh, the bit to have benefited from a very um, from all the new uh, research that's going on there's a clinical trial phase one clinic very near my home i'm able to go there the person who started it is uh, a rock star in clinical trial research and so i just feel like even though it was horrifying to get this diagnosis and at the time i was devastated I've been able to see over this period of time how uh, I've been able to use this diagnosis to, to really focus on the things that are important, and uh, particularly in terms of my writing. And I'm going to ask you more about your writing later because you've written so many phenomenal novels across genres. And I, for anyone listening who's not familiar with your work, I want them to get to know your whole body of work as well. But let's stay focused on this book for now. Kelly, this book, so beautiful. I'd love to hear a little bit more about it. And I'm guessing the readers, the listeners here haven't heard much yet because it just came out a few days ago. So why don't you tell us more about the story of the book? This is the story of an oncologist who... Uh finds out that her sister has uh, received a diagnosis of stage four ovarian cancer. So uh, the, the oncologist jumps off the fast career track uh, to walk through this season with her sister. And it has a huge impact on their family dynamics. Uh, they have some difficult childhood issues that have never been resolved. And there's this ticking clock now that makes them realize that they're going to have to mend those family issues now, why they have a chance, and it impacts on this oncologist's relationship with her husband and her children, and there's just so much uh, that happens when you have a diagnosis like this that affects every member of the family, your friends, uh, and so all of that is explored in the context of this woman who uh, thought she had it all together, and now she's uh, fa facing this uh, possibility that she's going to lose her only living family member uh, to cancer. And and I think that idea of like, you choose, sometimes we make decisions every day of how we spend our life, right? Like mm -hmm. you choose career, you choose home, you make a decision to go home five minutes later, yeah. five minutes earlier. 
And I think we always think like those, the accumulation of those decisions is like, it doesn't feel as significant, but then you get to a moment in life where you kind of start to question, yeah. like, did I really want to spend my life the way I spent it? And yeah. I think she's really asking herself that question in the novel. Like she's a, she's an oncologist and yet here she's facing trying to save her own sister when the odds are against her. And exactly. that to me was just a beautiful relationship that you painted between these two sisters. Uh, what, what made you decide to make it a sister story? I wanted to see how it would impact on the, their close relationship. Um, I didn't want the main, the first voice to be the, I didn't want it to be totally about this woman who has ovarian cancer because the impact it has on family is so tremendous. It changes everything. Uh, and just looking at how family members become caregivers, they, they become the the rock that you cling to in your darkest moments so having it be a sister story really helped me to tell both sides of the story as the patient and as the family member who's impacted by these uh th these developments and is there is there anything readers might be surprised changed from where you started as you started thinking about writing such a personal book is there anything that after reading it, I might go, oh, wow, I never imagined it was like that in its early versions. Uh, the only thing that I could think of in thinking about this question was that originally uh, Sherry, who's the uh, cancer patient, had four children. And the fourth one was a, a veteran who was homeless. And I wanted her to find him uh, because she needed to mend that relationship. And uh, I just, I'm homelessness and veterans who are homeless are issues that are really important to me. San Antonio is military city USA. So there's lots of issues going on related to veterans, but my editor said, there's way too much going on here. We don't, you know, you need to, to narrow your focus. And so Sherry ended up with three children. I, I could see that it's you, you've taken on such a taken on such a huge topic that it's kind of hard to love space yeah. for other stories in the, in the same uh, book. It's such a it's such a big book. Um, I'm just going to read one quick little snippet from Amy K. Runyon, who's been on the podcast herself, one of my favorite yeah. authors. And I loved how Amy describes it as a heartbreaking, truth telling look at the ravages of cancer on the body and soul. And I thought the end soul part was really important. And yeah. I just think the, the one word in that tiny snippet that's missing is just there's hope and there's joy in this book too, right? Exactly. There's love, hope, and joy too. And I loved how you did that. Yeah. There's, and there's humor. Uh, we, we have to look for humor. I, I was a newspaper reporter and my husband's in the news business. And when you talk about newsroom humor and it's sort of a dark, it's dark humor, <laughs> uh, but that humor is there and we have to hang on to it as well as hope. Right. Absolutely. Well, this is the latest in an amazing body of work where you've written across multiple genres. I'd love for you to tell those who are not familiar with your work a little bit about the different genres that you write in. And if you want to highlight any particular books they might have missed that are your favorites, feel free. It's um, so It's been an interesting journey. I actually uh, was first published in uh, Amish Romances. And so I've written Amish romances, romantic suspense, and now women's fiction. And people find that to be a really odd, long spectrum of writing. But all of my stories have the same basis. And that is that these are women telling stories. And they're strong women who uh, tell strong uh, stories. And so each one, uh, I love writing romantic suspense because that's what I originally thought I was going to do. It's just a... Uh, uh, that's what I like to read. I love to read mystery and suspense. And so I thought that's what I was going to write. And my career took a different turn. I love writing the Amish romances. I've written 25 or more of them. I have a couple more coming out. But um, women's fiction, my editor says, that's what she truly thinks I am, a women's fiction writer. Isn't that interesting, though? But you've written so many of these Amish romances that I imagine you may have more readers who know you from that side than from your women's fiction. That, yeah, that's true. And the thing is that the women's that Amish romances typically are sort of sweet uh, romances, but mine tend to have a lot more issues in them that women are dealing with within the context of the Amish uh, lifestyle. And so my editor kept saying, you're really a women's fiction writer in disguise. Uh, and so uh, when I had the opportunity, uh, when they, the publisher agreed to let me do women's fiction, I was very excited. 
Oh, that's exciting. And you know, you're not the first person to say that. In fact, I'm thinking Jamie Beck and Barbara O'Neill, Barbara Samuel, and there's been at least other three other writers that we've chosen for the podcast who've said like, you know, I ro write romance, but really I write women's fiction and we yes. call it romance, which has been yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, well, what advice might you have for other writers who would love to create such an amazing body of work and be able to write such a poignant book as this latest one? Like, what do you advise other writers? Uh, well, writers that are just starting out, I, I would give them the same advice that I received, which would be to uh, hone your craft, uh, attend uh, conferences and writing workshops, uh, do your best work before you start submitting it, um, to write, you know, put your behind in the chair and write, uh, to join a critique group and get a thick skin. I, I suspect that there's something that you would have to teach us about writing the stories you want to write. Like, I find it very interesting that that you took on this topic that was so personal and that you've written Amish romance and that you've written romantic suspense. And like, I think many writers feel like they have to stick to one genre and they feel like you, they've been told, right, you know, if you're going to ever write in another genre, you have to have a pen name and you can't be the same writer. Yeah. And I, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I can address that. It's... Um... It is difficult when you're starting out with a publisher, and even with in my situation, the you've built an audience. In my case, in, in Amish romance readers uh, and publishers, spend a lot of time, effort, and money helping you build that audience. So, as a new writer, it's likely that they're going to want to to specifically look at a particular genre. I was very fortunate that my publisher agreed to go out on a limb with me and do romantic suspense. Uh, and then as time went on, we talked about this women's fiction and, and my editor really went to bat for me uh, with the pub uh, team and, and so forth. So, you know, writing uh, in a particular genre, when you start out, it's important to identify what that genre is and have, you know, know who your audience is in order to get your foot in the door. Right, right. And then over time, you've got the power to kind of ask for a little more and expand. Mm -hmm. And that's a really interesting perspective yeah. that uh, as maybe you develop your reputation and show that you can do the work and uh, that you're a writer that they want to build. Because pu publishers and agents both are looking for writers that they can build a career with. They don't, they're not, it's not a one book thing, it's building a career around uh, the writer. That makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Well, what do you like to read and have you read anything good recently? Oh my goodness. I have just been on a tear recently. <laughs> I loved um, The Extraordinary Deaths of Mrs. Kipp was one of them, uh, which is an unusual topic. It's a, a split time, but it, it, just, it, it uh, delves into the life of a woman who's in hospice and a reporter who's sent to write her obituary before she's died. And I really recommend it. I uh, also have recently read uh, uh, William K uh, Kent Kruger's new book, The River We Remember, which is just an incredible, all of William Kent Kruger's books are incredible. I highly recommend them. Uh, but this new one is a standalone uh, that is uh, uh, set in 1958 and really looks at the the uh, biases and bigotry that was found at that time uh, against the Japanese after World War II and also Native Americans. So it's a, it's a book with, a, with some big uh, issues that it deals with. So those are two that I've read recently that I have just really enjoyed. Well, thanks. You introduced me to two, that I, two authors and books that I'm not familiar with. So mm -hmm. I always love when I get, get my mind expanded to <laughs> get to hear new authors for me. Um, is there anything I haven't asked you that you especially like to talk about relevant, relative to this new book or to your writing in general? Um, I would just say in regard to the uh, the year of goodbyes and hellos that part of my uh, underlying thought in writing this was to really draw attention to ovarian cancer and to remind women that this is the most deadly gynecological cancer uh, and that uh, it, it's that when they go to get their pap smears, they are not being screened for ovarian cancer. And I don't think a lot of women realize that. It has some very, uh, it has, its symptoms always seem to be something else. People think it's something else. So I just really encourage women to listen to their bodies and to go to their doctors and insist that, that some uh, 
uh, action being taken if you're not feeling right, uh, because it, it's almost always found in the later stages, and uh, that makes it much more difficult to treat. There was actually a line in this book where you taught me something that, to your point, I didn't know. I think I was in the category of women who thought that, you know, I go get my pap smear and I, I, I'm doing what I can. And um, there was a line when you say that said in there that very often, it often looks like IBS, like irritable bowel, bowel syndrome mm -hmm. and bowel yeah. issues. And as someone who has IBD, I have um, Crohn's disease. Yeah. It really struck me because I was like, oh, wow, yeah, I would just write that off and think it was no big deal that I, yeah. I wasn't feeling well and I was losing weight. And I think a lot of women might just go, OK, yeah. my stomach's not doing well these days. And, and doctors and not tend to do that because <laughs> they don't <laughs> don't think of it. So, um, so that was a, a learning for me. Thank yeah. you for that gift of teaching yeah. me something that I didn't know anything about this. So I'm in the yeah. category of women that you have uh, taught through this book. So thank you. Is there is there anywhere else that people that you recommend that women go to educate themselves about ovarian cancer? Is the is there a place or a set of reading that you recommend to people? Uh, well, there's some really good organizations out there. Overcome is one. Uh, uh, the National um, Coalition. Uh, they're listed uh, on in the book, um, but there's several online organizations that you can uh, just Google ovarian cancer. Uh, and it, they will come up as organizations that are reputable and can give you information. Wonderful. I'll put the links to the first couple of those and maybe pull a couple from the book and put them on the page, the notes for your episode great. here. That would be great. Well, I really appreciate you joining us and also you writing such a beautiful book and giving me the chance to be an early reader of it before it even came out. Um, I would love to uh, let people know where they can follow you. I know you're on TikTok, which is actually unusual for women's <laughs> fiction writers. Is TikTok the best place? Are you more on Instagram, your website? Uh, your, what, what do I'm you say? Just, I'm just get, really just been getting my feet wet in TikTok. It's uh, because of book talk and uh, that has become one place that you can reach out to readers that is uh, really being recommended uh, for, especially as I'm trying to, to uh, grow a new audience with women's fiction. Uh, but I am on Instagram and Facebook uh, and they can get uh, all the information about my books, of course, on my website at kellyirvin.com. Super. And we'll put the links to all of that as we always do on the website at bestofwomensfiction.com. And it's been a delight chatting with you. And I, I feel like you've educated me on something that I was pretty uneducated around and so important. So thank you so much. And just thanks for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it.